Good morning. Blessed Sabbath to you. As we have entered into this house of worship, it is filled with the holy angels, and we're so grateful. It's filled with the Holy Spirit. We just want to begin our worship with prayer. O oh, Holy Father, O oh, Elohim, our Jehovah, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your house of worship and to join by phone and to join by technology, Lord. We thank you so much that we are not isolated from you, that you are with us. Each we thank you so much that your spirit has filled this place before we were even we able we were even able to get into the building. You were already here. And so we just want to acknowledge you, oh God. We just want to invite you into our hearts. Every person joining online or on the call, we pray that our hearts would be open to receive all that you have prepared for us this day. This has not this day has not taken you by surprise. You already knew it and you had planned for us to join together to connect anyway. So we ask for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would fill our pastor, fill the, the music with your spirit. Lord, let there be a spirit of worship in this house. May you be glorified. May your people be transformed, O oh Lord. May the enemy be horrified because his plans did not succeed, that we were still able to worship you in spirit and in truth today. O oh Holy Spirit, have your way. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 When we all get to heaven, that's all I can think about this morning as we have all been forced to stay at home. But we, we can think about when we all get to heaven. We're going to sing all four courses of that this morning. So those of you at home, join in with us. And those few that are here, just join in with me. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toys of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. And soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, Hillcrest family. Amen. So good to see those who are here with us, the few that are here with us today. But it's so good to know that you guys are watching online and that we're still worshiping together. Uh, you know, this year we have experienced some unexpected tragedy and devastation in our nation and some of us, I'm sure, even in our own personal lives. Think about the death of Kobe Bryant, um, the untimely, his, his untimely death. We also think about the recent tornadoes that have devastated um, our community and now the coronavirus. And I'm sure, like me, it has all made us feel just a little bit afraid or unsure. But I want you to be encouraged that Jesus says, be of good cheer. He said, oh, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And I really believe that Jesus wants us to take that promise seriously. Amen. And so especially as we navigate uncharted territory, um, we want to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Uh, as many of you know, uh, because of the coronavirus outbreak and some of the uh, communications coming from the mayor's office here in Nashville, who is discouraging uh, public gatherings um, during this time until we're able to get a bit of a handle on the coronavirus. And so because of that, and because we want to err on the side of safety, um, we have decided to suspend our services, at least physically, um, together in person worship until further notice. So I want you to know that on by Monday evening, we will have some updated information to share with you concerning how we can still connect with each other um, and fellowship together online through, the, through his word, through Sabbath school and Wednesday night prayer meeting. We'll provide all of that information um, for you um, on this Monday evening. Just want to uh, make you aware of a couple things. Um, we want to remember Sister Bush, who's uh, lost her aunt and sister just over a week ago, all on, both on the same day. We want to continue um, to keep her in our prayers and of course all of our sick and shut-in members on our prayer list. I know that um, normally after this we would have a greeting time, we would get up and shake each other, but what we can do even while you're at home, you can turn to your spouse or your family and I want you to turn to them with a smile and tell them happy Sabbath, amen, happy Sabbath. And so I just want to wave to you today. I wish that we could be here together, but we want you to know that um, there is fellowship even in this medium. Amen. And so we want to encourage you to continue to tune in. Uh, just a couple of things today. At the end of our service, we will have a baptism. Um, Keston Ashmead um, is going to be baptized today. And so we're going to uh, participate um, together in that monumental moment in his life. Amen. And so at this time, we'll continue with our worship as noted. Uh, we will now transition to our intercessory prayer. We're going to be praying, uh, and conducting the intercessory prayer. And as you're at home, uh, or if you're listening on the phone, I invite you to uh, just close your eyes, uh, reach out to the computer or to the whatever medium you're watching, and just let's um, come before the Lord in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father and our God, first of all, we thank you for waking up this morning, and we thank you for our family thank you that if we that we are able to uh, come before you in prayer um, we've had lots of things happen uh, of uh, this past month um, just a few just a week or so ago we had a tornado um, and you protected us and you we've known of people who have lost their homes lost their cars um, and we just ask you to be with those individuals as, as they navigate this loss. Um, be with those who have lost their, food, those families who have lost loved ones during this tornado. Um, and just uh, give them the sense of peace that they'll need uh, to uh, come back from this. Uh, those, there are still individuals, Father, who don't have power. And I ask you that you will uh, make it possible that power will come back to their home so they can go on with their lives. Um, Father, I ask that the 
that we not panic. Uh, we have a coronavirus uh, pandemic in this world, and uh, we have taken steps. And I just ask you, Father, that we'll have that sense of peace that we'll need, because uh, we just uh, just help us to continue to have faith in you. Um, there are sick, there are sick among us. Uh, we have aches, pains, colds. Um, there are individuals who have. Uh, may have had surgery, and, and they're just in, in a they're, they're just in, we're, they're just in a state where they're just not well. And we ask you, Father, that you will give them the healing that they need, and and give them the faith to know that you will be with them always. Uh, Father, I ask you to be with the students. Uh, there are school closings. There are many college students who. Are, have, are having their lives disrupted because schools are closing down. I ask you to give them safe journey home. Uh, give them the, the, the wherewithal that they need to be able to transition to an online school and help them to do well. Be with the parents who are, are worried about their children not being home. Um, and just be with the government, uh, those of the government who are making decisions that will affect us. Help them to make the right decision uh, to uh, approach this, this challenge that our nation is currently having. Father, I just ask you to bless the pastor as he presents the message to us. Um, even though uh, the church may not be full, but we know that he has a message for us and that that message will, uh, will uh, speak to our hearts. I ask you to bless the family of the Ashmeads as they see their son getting baptized. We thank you for uh, the, the, the uh, parents of Keston that they have uh, seen fit to instruct him and to give him the opportunity to uh, know Jesus. And we thank you that he's giving his life to Jesus today. We're going to go ahead and uh, sing a song before I preach. God is able. God is able God is able God is able and he won't fail God is able God is able, my God is able, and he won't fail. Tell me who can make a mountain move out of my way. And who can make a miracle because of my faith? And when the doctor says no, who can still say yes? And when I'm in trouble, who's right there to help me pass every test? God is saved. God is able, my God is able, and He won't fail. Tell me who can make a river out of a little stream, and who can tell the clouds to roll back so the sun can look at me. And who can tell the wind to whistle through the trees? And when I'm in trouble, who's the same God that will come down and rescue me? God is able. God is able. My God is able.
God is able. My God is able, and He won't. He won't fail you, no, no. Mm. Just put your hands in His hands. He will never leave you alone. you to pray with me as we prepare to get into the word of God. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we are grateful that you are with us even in difficult times. And now, O oh God, as we turn to your word, pray that you would uh, align our hearts with yours, that you'd open our eyes, that we may see you today. Give us hearts of understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. In 1977, a book written by Fraser Kent was published entitled Nothing to Fear, Coping with Phobias. In his book, he describes a variety of obsessive and irrational fears, fears that impairs millions, impairs millions of Americans. I want to share just a few this morning. One is called paletophobia. It is the fear of baldness and of bald people. Another one is aerophobia, the fear of drafts, currents of air in a small place. Another phobia is called porphyrophobia, which is the fear of the color purple. Another one he lists is called ketophobia, which is the fear of hairy people. Then he has another one, levophobia, the fear of objects, objects on the left side of the body. Dextrophobia, the fear of objects on the right side of the body. Odontophobia, the fear of teeth. Gra graphophobia, the fear of writing in public, and lastly, phobophobia, the fear of being afraid. <laughs> now, I know that most of us probably are unable to identify with all of these different kinds of phobias. But it doesn't mean that we do not struggle with our own fears, fears in our hearts. It may be that we struggle with the fear of the future or the fear of unexpected calamity or the fear of getting sick. Maybe even the fear about the end of the world and wondering if we'll be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. Today, I want us to explore just for a few moments in God's word, how to deal with our fears and how to be ready when Jesus comes in a sermon entitled, Nothing to Fear. I want to invite you, those of you who are here and those of you online to turn with me to the gospel of Matthew chapter 24. And I want to read from the New King James Version starting in verse 1, and I'll read in your hearing all the way to verse 8. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple 
and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you that, assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the mountain of olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in, ver in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Nothing to fear. As Jesus and his disciples make their way out of the temple gates and down through the Kidron Valley towards the Mount of Olives, the disciples take in what appears to be an amazing view of the temple. They are so impressed by its beauty that they eagerly point it out to Jesus, thinking that he will also share in their enthusiasm. But Jesus' response not only shocks them, but it troubles them deeply to their very core. He says, not one stone will be left upon another. Every stone will be thrown down. In other words, every stone in that building will be demolished. Here, Jesus makes a shocking prediction that this magnificent edifice, a symbol of Jewish pride and nationality, will be brought to nothing but rubble. The disciples are alarmed because the temple was not only a sign of pride, but it was a symbol of their invincibility as a nation, as a people, and also a sign of the ongoing presence and the favor of God upon them as a people. They know that the destruction of the temple is cataclysmic. It means then that it will mean that if the temple is destroyed, that they will be under the judgment of God and that they must be to the close to the to must be close to the end of the world. His words stir their inner thoughts and fears and they question him privately for more information when they get alone with him. I want you to read again verse 3 what he says. Um, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Their question to Jesus also reveals their desire to be ready when he comes. They do not want to be caught off guard or unprepared. And so they press him as to what they should look out for in order to make sure that they are ready when he is getting ready to come. But I want us to notice the first thing that Jesus says. He says to them that they must be on guard against deception. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. Notice what he says in verse 5. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Revealing that the end time deception will be of a religious nature and it will be carried out by people pretending to be working in favor of Christ's agenda in the world. They will even claim to come in his name. Their words and their actions will be peppered, will be dripping with his name. But he says they will be deceitful imposters, false prophets. 
They will be seemingly focused on the mission of the church, but will lead the people of God off of the narrow path. They will make lies appear to be true. And Jesus says they will have a tremendous influence. As a matter of fact, he says not that they will deceive some or a few, but he says that they will deceive many. And he is not just talking about the people in the world that don't know God. He is talking about the people who are walking on the narrow way. He says their deception will be so convincing that even God's chosen ones, even the elect, will be tempted to turn off of the path. In the year prior to the destruction of the temple, in the years, I'm sorry, in the years prior to the destruction of the temple, there were many leaders who emerged claiming to be Christ. But not, only, but not only that, there were some that they never claimed to be Christ, but they, they emerged and they promised liberation, social justice from the Roman bondage and oppression. They appear, they appear to be on God's kingdom agenda. And because this was a real and legitimate need and concern of the Jews, they were deceived. The agenda seemed legitimate, but it was a deception, a distraction from Jesus Christ. Jesus said, this deception will be so powerful that the most committed believers will be tempted to turn away. I want to read that in verse 24 of Matthew 24. He says, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Here Jesus shows that the deception will be so compelling that it will cause people to turn away from God, it will come not only in the guise of good works, but it will become in the guise of worship. Signs and wonders in the church, and they will use his name. Came across an illustration about the lighthouse, a story about the lighthouse that was wrecked, that wrecked more ships than it saved. <laughs> Can you believe that? He said a few years ago, back in 1857, 1857, the authorities decided to build a lighthouse to warn ships to stay away. It was this area in Australia that was notorious for shipwrecks. And so they, they got an architect together and they began looking for suitable sites for where they could place this lighthouse. But unfortunately, this gentleman that was in charge of this was interested, the architect was interested in the ease of construction. He wanted the construction to go by easily. And so at, rather than providing efficient navigation aid. And so what they did now, they decided, they looked on the map and they found a, a place to build this lighthouse that was not favorable. The site was not visible from the required approaches. There were discrepancies on the map. They could not decide whether the positions on the maps really existed. But they selected the site anyway because it was closer to a quarry where they could gather the stones more easily. Most of the board members were not in favor of the site, yet for some reason they approved it, and for the next four decades, this ill-sided lighthouse was responsible for a dozen shipwrecks. Eventually, they finally got wise, and they replaced the, they replaced the, the, the lighthouse with a new one in a more suitable location. But even though they decommissioned the lighthouse, it still continued to cause navigational problems, especially on moonlit nights when the golden sand, sand tower stone glowed in the dark. So near the turn of the century, the tower was finally reduced to rubble to prevent 
any further disaster. An ill-placed lighthouse. I want to suggest to you today that deception is like an ill-placed lighthouse. It is like false teachers and false teachings that will shipwreck our faith. Even after they are off the scene, their teachings and their influence still has effects for generations to come. And what Jesus here is suggesting that there will be leaders who will seem like there are a lighthouse but not be heralds of God. Deception, Jesus revealed, will be the greatest threat to our faith. And if we are not careful, we will be lost and our faith shipwrecked. Jesus goes on to reveal to others yet another layer of things that will happen. I want to look there in Matthew chapter 24. Notice what he says in verse 6. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet. Jesus here lists that there will be nations fighting against each other, trying to be the greatest, trying to be supreme. He says that there will be famine, meaning that there will be widespread hunger. Today in our world, there are more than 815 million people in need of emergency food assistance, 20 million just on the east coast of Africa alone. He says that there will be pestilences. There will be widespread contagious diseases. It is being reported that there are over 149,000 cases and over 5,000 deaths as a result of the coronavirus. At least those that they have detected. Experts in the New York Times article published an article that says that they believe that between 160 million to 214 million people in the U.S. could be infected over the course of the epidemic. They say it could last for months or even a year and as many as 202 million, um, I'm sorry, as many as 200,000 to more than a million people could die because of the coronavirus. We may not have seen the worst, but we're trusting God that their predictions will be grossly wrong. Hmm? We need to pray for God to intervene. He says that there will be earthquakes. In the last... uh, Hundred years, there have been more than 10,000 earthquakes, just counting the ones that have registered more than six on the Richter scale. That's not counting the smaller ones. And what Jesus here is describing is an unprecedented time of prolonged suffering. He calls it, in verse 8, the beginning of sorrows, or more literally, the beginning of birth pains. Here Jesus is saying that people in the world will experience unprecedented suffering, dire calamity, and intolerable anguish before the coming of God. The best way that he can describe the pain is is a woman experiencing or giving childbirth. That's how intense it's going to be. And I can remember when my wife, when my wife was giving birth to our third child and we were driving and I guess I wasn't driving fast enough. And she just calmly leaned over and said, can you speed up, please? I put my foot on the gas and she couldn't wait. We got to the hospital. She couldn't wait to get out of the car, get checked in. And all she was concerned about was when they were going to give her the epidural. The whole time she was uncomfortable and finally they took her back in the room because you know they won't allow the husband to be there and by the time I got up to the room she was sitting there smiling watching TV because that how that's how intense the pain was and what Jesus is saying 
that the sorrow, the trouble that we will experience is like a woman giving birth. But notice what he says. He says that it's only the beginning of sorrow. That thi- and then he goes on to say that these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Hear me now. A time of human suffering will characterize the period prior to the coming of Jesus Christ. What we are experiencing, Jesus predicted, and it is to be expected. It's not going to get any better. It will characterize the world at the end of time. It will let us know that we're at the beginning. The trouble that we will experience in our world, hear me now, is designed to remind us of the reality of his second coming. Oh, you're not with me today. In other words, Jesus is saying, what Jesus wants us to understand in this passage is that when we see the coronavirus outbreak, he's saying when we see tornadoes ravaging your community, he says, look up, for your redemption draweth nigh. Oh, you're not with me today. It is a sign to take inventory of our lives and our relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a warning from God to the people of God to get ready. He's getting ready to come. But not only that, the calamity is to remind us of how finite our world is. And how much we are in need of a savior. We can't rescue ourselves from the coronavirus. They can't even trace it. They don't even know where it started. We are in need of a power outside of ourselves. The calamities, he allows them to come so that we can know that we need a savior, that our hope is in God. But they're also designed to remind us that the world is passing away. And no matter how indestructible or invincible our political leaders want to make America to be the world, America one day will pass away. And what Jesus wants us to know is that we cannot get comfortable or place our confidence in man and his inventions and his creativity and their institutions. Put our confidence in God, in God alone. And I love what Jesus says in the middle of all that. In verse 6 he says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Hmm. Oh, y'all not with me today. Here's the good news. He says, do not become alarmed. Do not become frightened. Do not become undone. Don't start panicking. Don't lose hope because of the tragedy you will experience in this world. He says, take heed. Do not be troubled. Jesus does not want us to be afraid for he says that these things must come to pass. He has already weighed it and measured it and it is still under his control. It is under his sovereignty. He is not asleep. He is not indifferent to the sorrow. He has already weighed it and measured it. He is still in control. And he says, do not allow it to shake your faith or your confidence in me. As a matter of fact, allow it to do the exact opposite. Let it remind you that I am real and that I am coming again. In fact, it is interesting that earlier in his gospel... When his disciples were alone on the sea, battling a storm for hours, he appears walking on the sea towards them. 
The Bible says they were out there for hours. And when Jesus come, when he arrives in the distance, he said they're afraid. The Bible says that they thought they saw a ghost. He said, be of good cheer. It is I. Oh, y'all not with me today. I'm the one from the beginning, the one that has always existed, that has no end, that has life in himself. He says it is I. Do not be afraid, he says. Although they were alone in the boat, the storm, in the storm, he had not left them. He had his eyes on them. And just when they needed him the most, he came right where they were. Oh, you're not with me today. He was willing to do whatever it took to get to them, even if it meant that he had to rearrange the scientific formula of water and turn hydrogen items and atom atoms and, and the oxygen atoms. Maybe he slowed them down so that they could stick together so that he could walk on the water. Or maybe he just created a whole new formula in that moment so that he could walk out to the sea to them. But whatever it took... Jesus was willing to do whatever it took in order to save and to remind his disciples that I am with you in the storm. Peter, y'all know the story. If it's really you, God, let me come out on water. And he says, come, and he steps out on faith. But what happens he starts looking at the storm. What does he do? He takes his eyes off of Jesus. And he begins to sink. And then while, just when he's getting ready to go under, he says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches his hand and picks him up and stands him up again. Oh, y'all not with me today. I want you to understand something from that story that we learn. The one thing we learn is that even when Jesus comes to us in the midst of the storm, he did not cause the storm to cease. The storm was still raging around Peter. But as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was all right. And I'm going to suggest to you today, my brothers and sisters, as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus, all hell can break loose. A coronavirus can do what it wants, but keep your eyes on Jesus. But even when you take your eyes off of him, Jesus is still willing to reach out his hand beneath the waves of our discouragement and our doubt, and our fear, and our lack of trust in his ability to provide. Even though we don't trust him, and we take our eyes off of him, when we call his name, he comes running. And he reaches down his hands, and he lifts us up. Finally, when Peter's in his arms, he puts him back in the boat, and the storm stops. My brothers and sisters, keep your eyes on Jesus. And just like he saves Peter, he wants to save us. He says, see that you're not troubled. Do not be afraid. This, I predicted, this will happen. Don't allow it to shake your faith in me. What he said. Last verse, and I'm going to read it. I just want to show you. How do we stay ready? Verse 47 of chapter 24. Did I write down the wrong verse? No, there, verse 42, I'm sorry. He says, watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. So it's all going around, but watch. Keep your eyes on him. Hmm? we don't know the hour. Yeah, these are the beginning of sorrows. But we don't even know the hour. He says, later, he says, the sign that I'm coming is when you see me coming in the clouds. Hmm. And by then, it will be too late if you haven't been watching. You haven't kept your eyes on him. 
But watching also includes making sure that our hearts and our lives are in alignment with him. We have nothing to fear as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Sing it with me. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Father. Lord, we're living in unprecedented times. It's a time of uncertainty, of fear. Not only are some of us dealing with our own insecurities, our own personal tragedies and hurts, but we see the world around us becoming undone. But Lord, in the midst of it all, you promised that if we keep our eyes on you, that you would keep us in your hand. Lord, give us the faith we need to hold on to you. May we allow our confidence in you to cause us to have hope. Lord, we pray for those who have been affected by the coronavirus, who have been diagnosed. Lord, we pray that you would be with them right now, that you would work a miracle and heal them. Lord, I pray that you will keep us all in your hands. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to transition to, we have a very special day today. Um, we have, we're celebrating the new birth of Keston Ashmead. And so I want to invite him to come to the stage right now. And I know his family's here. You guys can come closer. Um, Come on, Keston. And we want to, excited about this young man giving his heart to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Can you, some, can you go and tap in my office there for me? His friends are here. Can we just have him come out here, please? <laughs> That's why we brought them, right? <laughs> come on down, gentlemen. And if you guys want to come a little bit closer. So he has family that are here with him today to support his decision for Jesus Christ. And we are excited. Amen? Amen? And so, Keston, we just want to uh, just ask, I'm gonna ask you just a couple questions, and you just have to say yes at the end of them, okay? All right? Okay. So the first thing I want to ask you today is that do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, and do you desire to live your life in a saving relationship with yes. him? Amen. Do you accept the teachings of the Bible as expressed in the statement of fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? And do you pledge by God's grace to live your life in harmony with the teachings? Yes. And do you desire to be baptized today as a public expression of your belief in Jesus Christ, to be accepted into the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to support the church and its mission as a faithful steward of your personal influence and tithes and offerings in a life of... So I know I said, I said a lot there, Keston, but do you plan to give your whole heart and live your life for Jesus Christ? Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And so is there a motion to accept um, Keston into the membership of our church today? Is there a second? All in favor, please vote by saying aye. aye. All opposed? 
All right, the motion is carried. We're going to sing a couple songs. You're going to follow Sister Waters around to the pool, and I'm going to meet you around the end there, right? You guys can come a little bit closer, maybe fan the sides if you want to, just so we can keep the camera as our church family watches with us. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus, glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Singing glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Jesus lifted me, June I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me, when I was in trouble, Jesus lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah, glory, hallelujah, Glory, hallelujah, Jesus lifted me. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Keston. Because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your desire to walk with him all the way. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, yes. in the name of the Son, yes. in the name of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Be thou faithful unto death. today. Uh, I would say we had a small crowd, but I know there were some people who were watching on YouTube. But if I could, if you could just hold your place for just a moment, we're going to have benediction and we'll dismiss. Father, we thank you 
that we can have confidence in you even though the world around us is a storm. As long as we keep our eyes on you, bless us with your presence. Bless us with a heart and a mind to look to you regardless of our circumstances. Father, we ask that you would keep all those who are here and all those who are not safe as we navigate through the sickness that's encompassing the world. Thank you for stopping by and spending time with us. We pray that the Lord will continue to bless and keep you. We look forward to seeing you again.